Good evening, and as always, let me start by welcoming you very warmly to our worship of God here at Gilcomson Church. It is lovely to have you with us, and we do trust that it will indeed be a time that's enriching, uplifting, and indeed, above all, glorifying to God. Let us then join together to worship God in the singing of the hymn, Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of Creation. Let us worship God. Let's then join together in a prayer before God. Let us all pray. Almighty God, you are indeed the king over all creation. You made it, you run it, you love it. And we praise you that in Jesus Christ, your son, you have come right into your created universe. You have come and assumed our humanity. And therefore, as we draw near to you now through the name of your own beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, his work accomplished and now risen from the dead and ascended on high, we're glad that we have one who is indeed altogether sympathetic with our human condition, one who knows and understands it from the inside, not only because he made us, but because he is one of us now as well, having assumed that humanity. And we therefore tremble with a holy joy as we draw near to yourself again, 
delighting in everything that you have made known about yourself and humbly acknowledging that we are but finite creatures over against you, the infinite creator. Your understanding is infinitely greater than ours. Your ability to comprehend the end from the very beginning is infinitely greater and purer than ours. You see all things, you know all things, you're able to accomplish all things. And everything that you've made known about yourself, living God, makes it abundantly clear to our hearts that you are altogether good, you're altogether righteous, you are altogether wise and kind beyond all the measuring of it. And so we're glad always to take the opportunity on this one day in the week particularly to join with one another, to know that as we do so, we're not alone for all that we may be stuck in our own individual locations. We're nonetheless joining a vast multitude of individuals across the face of the globe and a vast, vast multitude that none can number down through the generations of humanity who one day will indeed be united together around your throne, rejoicing together in your great, complete salvation and giving to you and to your Son through the power of your Spirit all the praise and all the glory. And we're glad, therefore, on this Lord's Day again to conclude the day by placing our lives willingly and thankfully under your own gracious kingship, how altogether wise and good you are, our God, and how kind you have been towards us in all your dealings with us. You have spared nothing, but you have given the very best. You have sent your own beloved Son, and he has been willing to do for us absolutely everything that needs to be done in order to secure our truest and most enduring welfare and salvation. Are we praise you, living God, that he has set us on what you declare to be the path of life. You declare that the path of the righteous is indeed like the first light of dawn, getting brighter and warmer and more radiant as every day goes by until we enter into the full light of that glorious day yet to dawn when we shall indeed enjoy for all eternity the rich pleasure of your own nearer presence. Grant then, our gracious God, that as we join thus together in worship this evening, we may know the help of your Holy Spirit. We can only see you as our eyes are opened by him. We can only hear you, our Father, as you touch our ears and enable us to recognize your own holy voice. Only by your Holy Spirit are we enabled from our hearts to, to bring to you the praise that is your due. And we ask, therefore, for his help, that he might come in cleansing grace as we confess our sin and our sinfulness, that he might come in renewing grace to empower us in our weakness, to embolden us in our fearfulness, and that he might indeed fill our hearts and fill our every horizon with the rich blessing of that glorious hope secured for us in the resurrection of your Son. And may our praise indeed be such as delights your heart. So grant us, please, your help tonight as we ask it all through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Well, as we continue in our worship of God, we're going to join in the singing of a song that simply acknowledges that ultimately the best thing and the biggest thing, and indeed really the only thing that matters is knowing the Lord himself. And it's a privilege and a joy beyond all the telling of it to come to know relationally the risen Lord Jesus Christ. This next song uh, reflects on that. All I once held dear.
we turn to a passage in Scripture this evening which uh, ultimately drives on to precisely that conclusion that knowing the Lord is indeed the, the key thing in our lives and in our experience. If you have a Bible, um, it's going to be from the book of Psalms that we read this evening, Psalm 73. Over the course of the past number of weeks, we've been thinking around the, uh, the profundity of God's thoughts um, and recognizing that they, they are um, beyond our capacity to measure. They are so extensive and they are so exalted that we really are not always able to understand why God uh, does certain things, why God allows certain things. And the psalm this evening really is um, a psalm that gives us an insight into all of that. And uh, it's going to be read for us shortly, but before we turn to the reading and the preaching of the scripture, let's just ask that God himself would be our teacher this evening. Let us pray. God, our Father, um, it is that that we really desire above all else that you would take your own word and by your Holy Spirit that you would teach its truth to our hearts, not only illumining our minds, but applying that truth to our own circumstances, that we might be able to recognize what you are saying to us as your children. And we pray, Father, that as you speak into our hearts and lives this evening, you would indeed enable us to gain a truer perspective one that will issue in a deeper and humbler adoration of yourself as the great God and King over all. And this we ask for Jesus Christ's sake. Amen. Well, as I say, it is from the book of Psalms that we're going to be reading this evening, and the reading uh, tonight is going to be read by David. I'm glad that you're able to help us in this way, David, in the reading of Scripture. So over to you now. Uh, and good evening to you. Good evening. Tonight's reading is Psalm 73. Surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost slipped. I heard I had, I had nearly lost my foothold, for I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. They have no struggles. Their bodies are healthy and strong. They are free from the burdens common to man. They are not plagued by human ills. Therefore, pride is their necklace. They clothe themselves with violence. From their callous hearts comes iniquity. The evil conceits of their mind know no limits. They scoff and speak with malice. In their ignorance, they threaten oppression. Their mouths lay claim to heaven and their tongues take possession of the earth. Therefore, their people turn to them and drink up waters in abundance. They say, how can God know? Does the Most High have knowledge? This is what the wicked are like. Always carefree, they increase in wealth. Surely in vain have I kept my heart pure. In vain have I washed my hands in innocence. All day long I have been plagued. I have been punished every morning. If I had said, I will speak thus, I would have betrayed your children. When I tried to understand all this, it was oppressive to me, till I entered the sanctuary of God. Then I understood their final destiny. Surely you place them on slippery ground. You cast them down to ruin. How suddenly are they destroyed, completely swept away by terrors. As a dream when one awakes, so when you arise, O Lord, you will despise them as fantasies. When my heart was grieved and my spirit was embittered, 
I was senseless and ignorant. I was a brute beast before you. Yet I am always, I am always with you. You hold me by my right hand. You guide me with your counsel, and afterwards you will take me into glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And on earth has nothing, and on earth has nothing I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Those who are far from you will perish. You destroy all who are unfaithful to you. But as for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the Sovereign Lord my refuge. I will tell of all your deeds. Amen. Well, over the course of the past number of weeks, as we've uh, really been camped in uh, Paul's letter to the church at Rome in chapter, uh, chapter 11, just the end of that chapter, which rounds off with a great paean of praise where the apostle says, oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. Um, prior to that, he has given to us five great truths about God that really mean we are not always able to understand him, that his judgments, his way of dealing with things in the world, his ways of engaging with us as his creatures are unsearchable. We can't always fathom the reasoning behind what is going on. And that is all bound up with who God is. And it issues because we don't always uh, understand his judgments, the way that he works things out in the world. And because his paths, his ways are not our ways, because they are much higher and uh, much more enduring than our ways, uh, we do often end up, um, truth be told, disappointed. Things don't turn out the way we hope they would. Things don't turn out the way we think they should. And as a result, um, without in any sense getting all theoretical and philosophical about it, um, we do find ourselves struggling, struggling with disappointment. And that's one of the, the benefits of our being able to listen in to this man, Asaph, here in Psalm 73. Asaph was the musical director for David during his reign. Uh, he clearly was a, a very spiritual man. He was, I think, probably also quite an artistic man. He had a, a, a sensibility about him that meant he was perhaps the more attuned to these sorts of issues and felt them the more keenly. And this particular psalm is one of the most helpful in the Psalter in terms of teaching us how to handle disappointment. And it's under that heading that we really are going to be looking at this psalm and working our way through this psalm this evening because what Asaph does through this psalm is he provides certain uh, crucial footholds that enable us to, to climb up through that disappointment. And whatever your disappointment may be, and it may be you've got a catalog of different disappointments, things that have disappointed you, that uh, have prompted you to think somehow that God has let you down, he's not come up with uh, all that you had hoped for from him. Whatever your disappointment is, uh, this really provides you with the, the means of handling rightly that sort of disappointment. And so um, I, I want to simply work through this psalm with you this evening in that light and give to you a number of key footholds, a number of key principles, a number of ways in which you rightly handle it. And there is a certain order to this. Um, and I think Asaph is, is uh, under the inspiration of the Spirit of God. He is guided by God to, to give to us the, the right sort of order in the way we go about this. So here's the first basic principle. Uh, it is be firm in your faith. Um, it is, you'll see, an affirmation with which he starts. And that's always to be our starting point. You start with the great affirmations. And it is faith. 
Faith is, as the writer of the Hebrews says, uh, it is the assurance of things not seen, the conviction of things uh, not seen by us. We, we, we don't see this. It doesn't look like this is the case, but we hold on to this basic truth. And the basic truth that the psalmist here is underlining is that God is good. It's not complicated, that three very short words, but they are absolutely foundational. God is good. You start with that. That is an absolutely foundational, unchanging truth about the world in which you live, about the uh, eternity of which you are a part. You start with this bottom line truth. God is good. He is good in terms of who he is. That's underlined for us from the very beginning of Scripture. And he therefore always does what is right. When Moses in Exodus chapter 33 uh, asked God to show him his glory, the answer that he's given by the Lord is, 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 you can't see me, but what I will do, he says, I will pass all my goodness before you. And that's, that's the nearest you will get to actually physically seeing me. You will, you will see that I am altogether good. It is the goodness of God. The psalmist in Psalm uh, 34 says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Good in terms of who he is. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. Psalm 107 verse 1 as it starts off. And Jesus himself in, uh, in speaking with the rich young ruler, Luke chapter 18 verse 19 says, no one is good but God alone. God is supremely, uniquely, permanently, enduringly, unchangingly good. He is good in terms of who he is. So you hold on to that basic truth about God. That's who he is. He is good in terms of who he is. He is good, secondly, in terms of what he does. Um, it's very difficult for the scriptures really to underline this more clearly than they do because the very opening chapter of the Bible is shot through with this word about what God does. Um, Time after time in the account of creation, God acts, God works, and God looks and sees, and he sees it is good because everything that God does is intrinsically always good. There's not a shadow of doubt about it, not a shadow of, of grayness about it. It is altogether good. It is good. It is good. It is good. And then in the culmination, God looks and he sees, and it is very good. You move into chapter 2, and you see that there God says, in regard to the creation of the man, it is not good that the man should be alone. That's not good. And therefore, God's immediate response is that he will do something about it. I will make a helper suitable for him. God will address that which is not good because what God does is itself always good. And so God makes the, uh, he, God indeed puts the man to sleep and says, you will have no part of this. I will do it. I will do what is good, what is needed here. And when you come to the ministry of Jesus, you find that Peter, as he, as he summarizes the whole spectrum of the ministry of Jesus, those three remarkable years, is when Jesus was teaching and, uh, and ministering and healing and helping. And uh, as Peter in, in Acts chapter 10 uh, summarizes that whole ministry of Jesus, he says that Jesus was anointed by God with the Holy Spirit and power and he went around doing what? Doing good because that's what God does. He does what is good. He is good in terms of who he is. He is good in terms of what he does and he is good in terms of how he rules as well. And that book, the first book of the Bible, the book of Genesis, that starts with the account of creation and underlines that that is the key operative word to use about God. He is good in himself and he is good in everything that he does. That book ends in chapter 50 almost with a closing verse, with a statement that Joseph makes down in Egypt to his brothers, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good. In that whole kind of crazy, mixed-up story that for long enough must seemed um, totally out of sync with, uh, with anything that was good, God was actually working it all out for good. God was planning ahead. God who rules over the course of history, God was working all things together for good like that. And uh, that's the conclusion to the book of Genesis. This God who has been at work through it all, who rules over all the history and all the story of our lives, God is in 
indeed doing something that is good, the saving of many lives, as it's put there at the end of Genesis chapter 50. And we're meant to take that book of Genesis as a package and see that's how it begins. God is good, and what he does is good, and it ends. Um, although it may have seemed for long enough as though things were not going right at, at all, God was planning it all and ruling it all for good. God is good. Now, that's the opening standpoint. And you preach that to yourself. You remind yourself of that. It doesn't feel like that. It doesn't look like that. But you preach that word to you. The message of Scripture, God is good. Surely, says Asaph, God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. That's his opening statement. You are firm in your faith. That's the, the starting point, how you begin to handle disappointment. You start with these bottom line affirmations, foundational truths about God. The most basic of all is that God is good. Whether you feel it or not, you preach it to yourself. You learn to be your own pastor. You learn to impress this upon your heart, to teach yourself this and remind yourself of that. Verses 2 to 14 provide a second important principle, and that is be real with your doubts. Asaph is very honest. Uh, doubt is described by Os Guinness as faith in two minds. And see you, here you see a man who is clearly struggling with his doubts. And so verses 2 and 3, you'll see there is an acknowledgement by him of his frailty. The man has his doubts. He's not going to pretend that it's otherwise. He's not going to pretend that somehow he is, he is a super saint who never has any questions, never has any problems, never has any struggles, never has any doubts. That's not the reality. It's not the reality for him. It's not going to be the reality for you either. Uh, it's not the reality for a believer. So you don't pretend somehow that things are all hunky-dory. You don't say, yes, I'm fine, when actually you're not fine, when you're struggling. You are real with your doubts. Um, that's not the opening gambit. Your opening gambit is you're firm in your faith. You're saying, well, God is good, but hey, nonetheless, I'm struggling with this. So there is in verses 2 and 3 that acknowledgement of his frailty. In verses 4 to 12, you'll see as you look at these verses there that there is a, a, a note about his battles with perplexity. He is perplexed. Even the apostle Paul uh, spoke about him said, and said, there are times when I'm perplexed. I, I, I don't have a clue what is going on. I don't understand why God is allowing certain things. And here, Asaph, having said in verses 2 and 3 that uh, he struggles with these matters, my foot had almost slipped. I'd nearly lost my foothold uh, because of that envy of the arrogant, the prosperity of the wicked. He then goes on to outline what that perplexity is, and he sets out his problem basically like this. It has all to do with what he sees in the world, and um, he, he is asking the question, how come the wicked prosper? How come bad people do well in the world? How come the godless thrive? And you see here that that's the, the essence of his predicament, the essence of his struggles, the essence of the doubts that he has in his mind. He just can't get his head around it. That's his perplexity. Um, he speaks about the wicked on the one hand, and you see the way in which he speaks of them as uh, arrogant, that's to say self-confident, self-reliant, self-seeking, self-advancing, and so on, and wicked. There are people who deny God's existence. There are people who defy God's instruction. There are people who despise God's enthronement, and there are people who demean God's intelligence. Um, that's in essence what he's saying through the course of this passage. Uh, they deny God's existence. They live as if God didn't really exist. It's just a kind of fabrication in people's minds. They defy God's instruction in the sense that they act and they speak and they adopt attitudes and they engage with people in a way that is totally out of line with God's way of doing things. They are violent where God is gentle. They are arrogant, conceited. Their words are not pleasant and, and so on and so forth. They are totally defying God's instruction. They, they despise God's enthronement, any notion that somehow God is going to be king. God God is going to make the rules. God is going to tell me how to live. They despise that, and they, they demean God's intelligence. Can God really know? Does God really know what is going on in my life and what is going on in your life and what is going on in the world? No. Uh, they, they are like that. And, and Asaph is aware of that. He looks around. That's what he sees in the world around him. They see, he sees people who deny God's existence, defy God's instruction, despise God's enthronement, and who demean God's intelligence. 
And how come, he's asking three questions basically, uh, uh, summarizing these verses two to, uh, two to 14 like that. He's, he's asking these questions. Number one, uh, how come they don't get zapped? I mean, if, if I was God, he's saying, if, if I was God and I saw these people who deny God's existence, who defy God's instruction, who despise God's enthronement and demean God's intelligence, they'd just get zapped. I, I have all the resources. I have all the, the cause of righteousness on my side. I have every good reason simply to zap them. How come they don't get zapped? That's the first question that he's asking. Um, to put negatively, they, they don't seem to have struggles. They don't seem to have burdens. They don't seem to have ills at all. And if I was God, he was saying, um, basically, if I was God, they would, have, they would have a whole load of struggles. They would have a whole load of burdens placed upon them, and a whole load of bad things would be happening to them. But he says, I, I don't see that. I don't see any struggles. I don't see any burdens. I don't see any ills at all. So that's his first question. How come they don't get zapped? Second question, how come they actually seem to prosper? They seem to have nice homes. They seem to get good health. They seem to get great holidays. They seem to amass a whole load of wealth. How come? It makes sense, he says, that uh, people who uh, do bad... Uh, enjoy good, good health, good homes, good income, good career. How come? So how come they don't get zapped? How come they seem to prosper? And how come, thirdly, how come they are so popular? They get the crowds uh, following after them. People turn to them and drink up waters in abundance. Um, that's his problem. They, 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 they seem to, to have that capacity to attract a following after them, people who, who should be acknowledging God as creator, who should be bowing before the living God and, uh, and recognizing him and who should be spurning these folk. They seem to be very, very popular. They seem to draw the crowds like that. How come? And so, as well as acknowledging his frailty in verses 2 and 3, he describes those battles with perplexity in verses 4 to 12, and then in verses 13 and 14, he describes his sense of futility. The conclusion that he's, he's almost drawn to as he sees what is going on in the world is simply to, to ask himself and to ask God, what's the point? You know, you call me to live a righteous life, but it doesn't seem to pay to live a righteous life. It doesn't seem to get you anywhere. It seems to be a pretty much a dead end. And the people who, who pay scant regard to yourself, to your existence, your instructions, your being king, and your knowing things well, people who pay no regard at all to that, they seem to get on in life. They seem to have a, 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 a fast track to success in life. What's the point? of trying to live out a life of faith? What's the point of trying to live out a life that is honoring uh, to the living God and worshipful of yourself? Surely in vain, I've kept my heart pure and washed my hands in innocence. Why? Because uh, instead of them having the struggles, I get the struggles. Instead of them having the problems, I get the problems. Instead of them having illness, I get the illness. All day long, I've been afflicted. Every morning brings new punishment. It's a tough life that I'm living. He's saying to the Lord, it's tough and the things that are happening to me are tough and they're hard to bear and it's, it's not comfortable, it's not easy, it's painful and, and a whole load of stuff comes in my direction. It seems sometimes that all hell gets let loose on me and, and what's the point then of living a life that uh, is directed towards the Lord if all that you get in return is a barrage of problems and struggles? Now, Asaph is, is just being honest and there's um, a need for that honesty. Um, that, I think, is what, what um, the Lord is on about in, in Psalm 62, where, where the psalmist David there says, Trust in the Lord at all times. Pour out your hearts to him. Just pour it out. You got problems, Asaph? Pour it out. Tell me what it is. Tell me what your struggles are. Tell me why you, you are thus disappointed. Just pour it all out. Don't, don't pretend somehow piously that, yeah, you know, you can cope and God is good and that's, that's all you need to know. Uh, you got doubts? Tell me about the doubts. And that's what Asaph is doing. He's pouring out his heart to the Lord. And, and that's the scriptural injunction. Be real with your doubts. You've got doubts, pour them out. You've got fears, pour them out. If you've got uh, anger, pour it out. If you've got envy, pour it out. If you've got a whole lot of issues, pour them all out. Give me your heart, says the Lord. 
And that's what Asaph is doing. And that's an important way of handling your disappointment. Don't somehow try and block it down and suppress it and pretend that actually you're not really disappointed. If you are disappointed, tell God you're disappointed. If you have doubts, tell God you've got the doubts. Whatever it is, be real with your doubts. That's the second thing, verses 2 to 14. Then a third uh, important, consequent principle. Be wise in your words, verse 15. You pour out your heart to the Lord, which is what Asaph is doing. Not just willy-nilly across the board to anyone who happens to be in hearing range. Verse 15, if I had spoken out like that, I would have betrayed your children. Think, in other words, before you actually speak to others in a way that is, is demeaning of God. You, uh, you trust in the Lord at all times. You pour out your heart to him because God is a refuge and you are far more cautious about spilling the beans to those around you, particularly your fellow believers. You'll see how he speaks about his fellow believers and it's an important recognition that he has here, an important one for you and me to recognize as well. They are not just your fellow believers they are his children. If I had spoken out like that, I would have betrayed your children. And uh, yeah, it may be that, uh, that these are doubts that I have, that these are issues that I have, that these are struggles that I have, but I'm, I'm not helping those who are your children. And I need to be careful because these are the blood-bought children of God whom he cares for, who may be very fragile in their faith, who may be very um, uh, unrooted thus far, just uh, little shoots of faith coming up, but they are God's children. And I dare not, I dare not do anything that is going to knock them flat, knock them over, and make life even harder for them. Uh, so there is a recognition by Asaph here that these fellow believers are God's children. And therefore, he must be careful about what he says and how he says things and to whom he actually does speak and share the issues that he has. And he, I think, understands the, the sacred commitment that he has. I would have betrayed your children. I would have been one who is acting treacherously, doing harm to your children if I had spoken like that to them. Now, I might have been inclined to, I might have just wanted to get it all off my chest because most of the time we do, if we are frustrated, if we are disappointed, if we are resentful, whatever it may be, we, we do just want to get it off our chest. We want to spill the beans like that. And that, that really indulges a, a desire that we have because it makes us feel good. If we can just get it off our chest and, and blurt it all out and say what a wretched God this is who is dealing with me like this and so on and so forth. But if I'd done that, he says, I would have been treacherous towards your children. I wouldn't have been helping them at all. And I have a sacred, solemn commitment in Christ to do them good, not harm. Not to, to lay on their shoulders all the burdens that I have as well, but to ensure that I do them good. I remember when uh, I was in Cumbernauld, there was a, an elderly man there called Sam, lovely uh, elderly man who complained about a former minister who, uh, he said, from the pulpit, this former minister used simply to, to explain to his congregation all the doubts that he had and all the problems that he had with this particular text and how you squared this with God. And, and he would use the, the, the sermon to, to pour out all the doubts that he had. And Sam would say to me, so listen, I've got enough problems of my own without having the minister spill his problems onto me as well. I don't want his problems. I want his help. I want his encouragement. I want his assurance. That's what he's there for, to bring God's word to me, not to feed me all his doubts, all the issues that he has and he was absolutely right it was psalm 73 verse 15 if i had acted thus if i'd spoken out like that i would have betrayed your children we are to ensure as paul puts it in 
uh, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29, don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths. Now, we, we sometimes assume that what he means by that is simply, you know, be careful about the language that you use and don't use too many swear words and things like that. And, and just be careful so that your language is correct and, and good and healthy and you, you can avoid certain subjects and so on. Um, but unwholesome talk, it can be, be exactly this. Don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only, only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs. Not your needs, not how you feel, but according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Now, Asaph understands that. And in handling disappointment, it's important that we too recognize that. Um, yes, we, we start off, we are firm in our faith, and yes, we are real with our doubts. But the, the reality of that is, is something that we, we pour out before the Lord primarily. We pour out our hearts to him. And we're careful as we speak with others. Um, you may well be disappointed with the way things have turned out for you. And that disappointment with God may, may quite easily spill over into a resentful spirit, a, a certain resentment towards God that is actually directed in the, the devious ways in which we function as human beings. That resentment towards God uh, gets directed because we like to be pious, we want to keep in with God, so it gets redirected towards his people and we become resentful towards them we take it out on them and Asaph is saying no um, you need to be careful that in handling your disappointment you don't take it out on God's people because they are his children and you have a sacred commitment to build them up principle four verses 16 to 26 uh, the the lengthiest part in many ways be clear in your mind. Now, there are, as you'll see from the screen there, there are four different aspects of this. It is so important that you and I learn to use our minds to think clearly and rightly under God. Be transformed, says Paul in Romans 12, by the renewal of your mind. We learn to function on the basis of our thinking rather than our feeling. And you'll see how the, the psalmist here, Asaph, works his way through this. First of all, being clear in your thinking means, verses 16 and 17, that you are in your place at church worship. If you are disappointed with God, it is tempting to skip church. It's kind of the last place you actually want to be because you just, uh, you, you kind of feel resentful towards God. You feel disappointed with God. You, you want to take it out on him. You want to turn your back on him. You want to just go in the huff with him. And that's the last place you want to be. But actually, it's the first place, the most important place you need to be. Don't skip church. That's where you need to be to get your eyes fixed back on him. It may be that um, that's you this evening. It may be that you are, you are sorely tempted just to give it a miss because of things that have been going on in your life. And truth be told, you are disappointed with God, how things have worked out for you, how God hasn't come good, how he hasn't done what you thought he should have been doing and should have been doing a long time ago and he hasn't been doing at all. And, and you are tempted, but God just saying, no, um, this is where you need to be. You need to come and you need to get your eyes fixed back on me. When I tried to understand all this, it troubled me deeply till I entered the sanctuary of God. And then I understood their final destiny. And that really leads on to the, the second aspect of what uh, Asaph is saying here in terms of using our minds rightly and being clear in our thinking. And that is, as well as being in your place at church worship, you, you read to the end of the story. 
Um, they may be those who aren't getting zapped at the moment, who are prospering, who do get a crowd of people following. It may be they have no struggles. It may be that they have no burdens. It may be they have no ills. It may be things are going really well for them. These who deny God's existence, defy God's instruction, despise God's enthronement, and demean God's intelligence. And you'd think, surely God should be doing something. The righteous judge of all the earth, surely he should deal with that. And what Asaph is recognizing is he will. You, you may count on that, he will. You need to read to the end of the story, not stop halfway through. Um, let me put this uh, quote on the screen for you from Philip Yancey's book, Disappointed with God, where he says this. He says, faith means believing in advance what will only make sense in reverse. Faith means believing in advance what will only make sense in reverse. Now, that's not just a kind of cute little one-liner that's uh, fed out by a, a very notable author. It is a profoundly important truth. That is the essence of faith. You believe in advance what actually will only make sense in reverse. And the scriptures are, are simply full of illustrations of that, really the whole way through the narrative of God's people you need to read to the end of the story. If you bail out of the story of Joseph and the Old Testament too early, you miss the point completely. If you kind of um, reach a point where you think, hey, this is, this is just not fair, the way that this guy seems to get, uh, uh, get it in the neck and he hasn't uh, really deserved any of it at all. It just seems to go from bad to worse. God doesn't seem to be pitching up at all. What on earth is going on? Why does God not come to his rescue? Why does God not bail him out? Why does God not help him like that? And if you decide, hey, listen, I'm, I'm done with this God. I don't want to know a God who allows his people people to, to experience that sort of thing, and you bail out before the end, you miss, you miss the kind of crunch line. You miss the way in which God is able to turn the whole thing around in a most remarkable fashion. If you read the story of the, the people of Israel coming out of the land of Egypt, the way in which they are remarkably delivered, and you think, yeah, that's marvelous. That's wonderful, the way in which God has worked in their lives, and he leads them there. And then you think he's, he's just led them right up the garden path because bang in front of them, there is a massive sea. On either side, there are two mountains. And behind them, there is the whole army, the mighty army of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, uh, a powerful, powerful army. What hope do they have? Where can they go? Where can they turn? They can't go over the mountains on either side. They can't go back because they're going to get clobbered. They can't go in front, they're going to get drowned. What on earth they God has led them up the garden path. You bail out at that point and think, I, I don't want to know a God like that who just leads me up the garden path. You miss, you miss what God is doing. Read to the end of the story and see the way in which God marvelously and wonderfully opens up a way they hadn't dreamed of and opens up a way into a future that is fulsome in all its potential and all its glory. Read to the end of the story. If you read through the, the book of Esther and, and bail out halfway through because you think this is just going from bad to worse. This is not fair. Where is a God who, who is meant to deal in righteous manner with the peoples of this world when they're ganging up against his people and the most unfair, arbitrary sort of way, using their power, abusing their power, and, and knocking those who are already weak and vulnerable, locking them to the ground like that. Where is this God? If you bail out and think, I've, I've had it, and you, you walk off like that, you miss what God is doing. And supremely, obviously, if you follow the ministry of Jesus, as you walk that through the ministry of Jesus, and you see the things that he does and see what a good life he lives and see what the good things are that he does and how he meets people in their need and the things that he teaches. And you think, that's, that's terrific. And then you see the death that he is dying and the way in which he is, he is arrested like that, the way in which he is betrayed, the way in which he's handed over, the way in which he is tortured like that and then crucified on that cross and the way nailed to the cross, he is, he is dead and then buried. And you think, I, I don't want a God like that. I want a God who is righteous, a God who deals right. And if you bail out before the end of the story, you miss, you miss the remarkable things that this God is pleased to do in the way in which he turns things around in an instant. Read to the end of the story. And don't assume that this particular juncture in the story, in the story of your life and in the story of the world in which you live, is the climax of the story. You are not the center of the story. The story is not about you. Read to the end of the story. And then you'll see the final destiny. You'll see your final destiny as well. And therefore, he moves on in verses 21 to 22 to uh, underline this in terms of being clear in our thinking. Um, you, you learn to scoff at the claims of your feelings. 
we live in a, a hugely feeling-oriented culture. Everything is according to what I feel. And feel good doesn't feel right. And, and feelings don't help you at all. They make huge claims upon you. But you learn to scoff at those claims. Read what he says in verses 21 and 22. When my heart, it's feelings, was grieved, that's a feeling, and my spirit was embittered, I was feeling resentful, I was feeling angry, I was feeling disappointed, I was feeling like that. See what he says? I was senseless, I wasn't using my head, I was ignorant, I wasn't thinking things through. I was a brute beast in front of you. Feelings are the way that animals operate. You are not an animal. You are a human being. You are one who is made in the image of God. So you don't operate like an animal. You operate as a human being. You are not a bull in the bull ring who sees the color red and charges there stupidly and foolishly. You are a man or a woman made in the image of God. You have a mind that has been given to you. You learn to think and you learn to scoff at your feelings and be ruthless in the way in which you deal with yourself and your feelings. When my heart was grieved, when my spirit was embittered, I was a brute beast. I was nothing more. I was just behaving like an animal. And I'm more than that. And so he goes on. The flip side of that, 23 to 26, you cling. This is all part of being clear in your thinking. You cling to the fact of God's presence. And that's the great reality that's impressed upon you always by the Lord. Do not be afraid because I am with you. In Jesus Christ, that's the bottom line truth about you. The God who is good has come to be with you and he never leaves you. He never forsakes you. That whole issue of forsakenness was dealt with once and for all on the cross when Jesus died and when he soaked up and exhausted the being forsaken by God. It is being drained. There is no more of that forsakenness because he has drained it all for you and therefore the reality for you is God is always with you and that's what he's holding on to for I'm always with you and he pinpoints these three great truths about that you Lord you hold me by your hand you guide me with your counsel and you take me to your glory the same word that is used about Enoch in Genesis chapter 5 that God simply took him took him to his glory. Now, that, that's what you need to hold on to. Whatever may be happening in your life and whatever else may be going on, however disappointing you may think in terms of the way things are turning out, you hold on to this. You are always with him. The God who is good is always with you, absolutely always, moment by moment by moment, day by day, place by place, wherever you are, whatever you face, whenever it is, always with you. And he holds you by your hand, by his hand. He takes a hold of your life. And he always guides you by his counsel. He has come as the Spirit of God to, to be your counselor. And he will take you through all the ups and downs and through all the darkest valleys. He will take you to his glory. That's what he's come to be and to do. So he has you by your hand dragging you along some of the time because you are so perplexed and so baffled and so angry with him and so resentful towards him but he has to drag you along but he holds you by the hand he will guide you through all the ups and downs and he will take you to his glory that's what he set his heart on and his intent upon like that and and that's what he is clinging to he is clear in his thinking how important that is so we've, we've got four. Let's just uh, round off with the fifth before we end off our, our worship this evening. Uh, firm in your faith, yes. Um, real with your doubts. Wise in your words, clear in your mind. And then finally, 27 and 28, be true to your king. There is a choice, in other words. And the essence of the choice is simply this. Who is going to be king in your life are you in other words are you going to be near God or far from God those who are far from you will perish 
but as for me, it's good to be near God. And you'll see, incidentally, just how uh, the, the closing verse uses that same word about God that he began the psalm with. Surely God is good, and therefore it is good to be near God. So how are you going to live your life? That's the key question. Who is going to be king in your life? Is it going to be you, or is it going to be him? Who is wiser? You or him. Who is stronger? You or him. Who is purer? You or him. Who is kinder? Who is fairer? You or him. Who is truer? You or him. The answer is always him. He's always wiser, always stronger, always kinder, always fairer. Uh, he's going to make a far better job of being king than you are. So you, you get near to him. You don't distance yourself and say, hey, you know, I don't want you to be king. I want to be king myself. You don't distance yourself from him. You, you choose to be near to him and near to the one who is king, who is God, who is from everlasting to everlasting, who is full of mercy, who is always true to his promises. Even though you don't always understand what is going on, even though you don't always understand why he allows certain things and why he doesn't act in the way that you think he should act, you hold to this, you cling to him, you get near to him and say, Lord, you're king, and I'm trusting you because you are wise and you are good and you are, you are kind and you are strong, and you will bring things through to a good conclusion. And so you're either in the kingdom, near to God, under him as king, or you are distant from him, outside the kingdom of God, outside the realm of the living God. And therefore, it is ultimately a matter of life or death. Those who are far from you perish. Um, what could be clearer? What could be more starkly stated? Again and again and again in the scriptures, that's the choice. Either you come near God and live your life near him where he is king and you live or you choose to be distant from him. Those who are far from you, who disown, disavow God's kingship, who deny God's existence, defy God's instruction, de despise his enthronement and demean his intelligence and say, hey, I can manage fine without reference to you. Those who are far from you, from you perish. You destroy all who are unfaithful to you. That's a very sobering reality. You may not see it here and now. You may not see the evidence of it here and now because God is very patient uh, and, and that patience is, is designed to lead people from the folly of their ways to a true repentance. But as for me, he says, it is good to be near God. I don't understand everything, and I'm perplexed and baffled and, and confused. Now, I've got a whole load of things that I have to pour out, but it's good to be near God, to know that I have him, because ultimately, who else do I have, as he's put in the earlier verses? Whom have I in heaven but you? That, that's, heaven is just full of God and all his goodness and all his beauty and all his creator glory. Heaven is full of him, and, and here on earth, th there's nothing ultimately that I desire apart from, from you. Nothing makes sense of life if I don't have you, the great creator, the great king, leading me forward, sharing your work with me. So it's good to be near God, and I've made the sovereign Lord, the king, I've made that God my king and my refuge. And I know that as I live out my life in his kingdom, I will indeed be in the fullness of time. I will be telling his wonderful deeds. When I read to the end of the story and I see the way in which God has turned things around, I see the way in which God has used all manner of things that at the time seemed painful, hard to understand, perplexing, and totally out of line with what I should, thought he should have been doing, I see in the fullness of time just how God has used them and caused them all to work together for his glory and for my good. Then I will be telling of all his deeds. And so as you handle disappointments, you're going to have disappointments, but as you handle them, you, you learn to do so in this way, by uh, being firm in your faith, real with your doubts, wise in your words, clear in your mind, and true to your king, because he's the only king, really, that, that you, you, you could wish for in your life. He rules well. He rules wisely. He rules kindly. He rules gloriously. 
And in his kingdom, there is life in all its fullness, a life that is only going to get better, richer, fuller, and more and more glorious. You are true to your king. Bless God for Asaph. Father, thank you for the testimony of this man. Thank you for the honesty that he has. Thank you for the integrity that he has. And thank you for the perspective that he's able to, uh, to bring to bear upon the struggles that he has. Would you make us, Father, good learners, that we, like him, should, should be careful in terms of those who are your children, that we seek always to build them up rather than to do them down, to encourage them rather than to discourage them. And would you help us, Father, sort of fix our eyes upon yourself that we might learn to recognize those basic truths about yourself and the privilege and blessing that it is to have you always with us. How we thank you for that, Father. How we thank you for Jesus. Help us to rest in him and rejoice in him always. For his name's sake, amen. Well, as our closing praise, let's join in the singing of a, a hymn that celebrates God's gracious hand from beginning to end in our lives. I will sing the wondrous story.
thank you for sharing with us in this time of worship this evening. Whatever these coming days may hold for you and whatever struggles you may have, may you be assured of his presence always with you. And to that end, we join with one another in enveloping each other in the gracious love of Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen.